What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report, and uh, this has been, this is a crazy episode because not only do we have a guest, the uh, one and only Judge Mathis, a man who really does not need an introduction around here, but we're all also doing this from three different time zones. I think that's the first time that's ever happened on this show, uh, so finding a time for us all to do this it was, was kind of crazy, but uh, here we are, ready to go, and we have a really, really fun topic for you guys today the best trades slash signings in Bill's history. We're doing a snake draft for those that uh, saw our tailgate draft with Kyle and Casey. We're doing that exact same style here. Uh, I think uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. But first of all, guys, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I think me and Judge are in the same boat. That we're, I think Judge is probably already done. I got three days left of work. And... Uh, just getting ready to uh, kick my feet up and enjoy some summer vacation. Oh, yeah. The, the only reason I became a teacher was to get my summers off. Don't <laughs> let anyone fool you. But uh, no, here in Arizona, we actually end in uh, May. So I've been I've been out of work for three weeks now, growing out the beard, um, just being an overall bum. So, um, you know, just living it up. Never a bad thing. But uh, guys, let's get right into it because this again, we, we got a draft to start. So, Ryan, you've kind of set up the draft order. Who's going first? Who's going last? Uh, what, what's this draft looking like? So we are going to, like you said, we're going to do the snake draft style, guys. Uh, and I did this with a, just a, a, I set up the snake draft. So one, two, three, three, two, one, all that stuff will snake through like a fantasy football draft. So our number one pick, our number one pick is Mitch. I'm second, Judge is third. And I'm going to write all the notes down here with who picks what. And then at the end, I'll make a nice little graphic and I'll I'll put it up and see who uh, who built the best signings and trades uh, draft at the end of this. And I'll throw it up on Twitter. Awesome. And uh, so, I mean, I say, you know, we get this clock going. I mean, I got my big board ready. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I had the first overall pick of the tailgate yeah. draft. So I, I, I'm on a little bit of a roll here. So I'll get things started off. With the first pick of the best, I guess we could just say signing slash free agent draft here for the Bills. You know, I'm I'm going to go with Mario Williams. And I know that things ended poorly with him in Buffalo. And that fans didn't like him. His effort definitely tapered off. But let's not forget, his first three years in Buffalo, the guy is about as dominant as they come. And we haven't really had a pass rusher like him ever since and i think that although there's a couple really great candidates i could have taken here i think pass rush is really so crucial so i'm gonna go mario williams my first overall pick i love mario i think i I, he had 34 sacks in three years and he was just one of those guys that effed up your game plan i don't think maybe since aaron Schobel, there hasn't really been a guy and even with it, I don't even know if Aaron Trouble was quite the caliber player Mario was. Mario could just ruin a team's game plan. Even if he wasn't getting sacks, he always seemed to be in the backfield. And he was just an absolute beast. And I think a lot of it soured because of the way it ended with Rex Ryan and him kind of having a Kelvin Benjamin-esque ending his two's career in Buffalo in terms of his effort. And the thing about Mario Williams, too, is that was the first thing since, like, I mean... You think about buzz surrounding the Buffalo Bills and like the buzz surrounding an offseason move. There was obviously Terrell Owens. There was obviously the 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 hoopla surrounding Drew Bledsoe. And then before that, you had to go all the way back to like Jim Kelly. Whether was he going to go to the USFL? Was he going to go to the NFL? So there really wasn't a lot of buzz around you know the Bills in the offseason in terms of free agencies and moves that they make. And this Mario thing was crazy. I remember I was on spring break in Myrtle Beach. And I was the one loser who was like glued to the television every chance he got trying to figure out whether the Bills were going to sign Mario Williams or not. Everyone's like, come on, come to the beach. Let's drink. Let's party. And I'm like, "Ah, I want to see if Mario Williams signs with the Bills. And imagine because I think it was I think Twitter and stuff was around back then in 2012. But imagine if Twitter was as big as it was now. I mean, people in Buffalo were stalking that one steakhouse. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but the steakhouse that they always brought. 
they ended up bringing like Robert Meacham there a couple of days later, uh, but never pulled the trigger on Meacham. And everyone thought, oh, the Bills were going to go out and get that offensive weapon in Meacham. They're going to get Mario Williams, Mark Anderson. This is going to be it. So there was just so much hoopla surrounding that Mario Williams signing. I think when you think of Bills free agent signings oh, over the past 20 years, Mario Williams has got to be number one with a bullet just for all of the 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 insane fanfare that surrounded it. Mario Watch was real. Yeah. Yeah. But absolutely. And that's why I picked it one. I just thought that that was kind of the start of the end of that era for the drought where the Bills just didn't spend money and just kind of never made any big moves. I just think that that move kind of, although it didn't maybe lead to as much winning as maybe fans hoped. I think that the production was there. The player was worth what they were paying him. And like, you know, you guys said, it really was kind of that first time where it felt like the bills were active for once in the off season. So uh, that is why I took them. But I guess uh, Ryan, now you're on the clock with the second overall pick. So who are you taking in the, in the draft? Before moving on to my second pick, I do have a, a quick, funny story about that. As some of you might know, I went to me and height, me and nap were in the same high school graduating class. And I remember that day being, like you said, glued to your phone. And it happened while I was in APUS. I don't remember if he was in my APUS or if he was in a class next to my APUS. But I remember class ended and the me- message came out that he had signed or that they were going to agree to sign. And I like burst out into the hall because I'm a loser. And I was like, and man, granted, me and Nap weren't really friends in high school. We just kind of ran in different circles. But I, I burst out into the hall. I don't know if he remembers this or not. Because I, I remember coming out of the hall and going, Mario Williams is a bill. And he happened to be somewhere near. He's like, where are you hearing that? Where are you hearing that? So little uh, the, the F connection. The only time Ryan and Nap talked in high school was over Mario Williams. I think, that might, I think that might have been it. I think that literally <laughs> might have been it. I also appreciate the humble brag. Came out, walked out of AP US. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> the, 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 the bills and, and social studies is about the only thing I'm good at in my life. So I, I got yeah, you're a math that. teacher. So kudos to you. <laughs> um, but anyway, so for for the second pick in the best signings or trades ever, I have to go with number one on my big board is still here. Jerry Hughes for Kelvin Shepard. I think when you look at pure value and do you guys know what Kelvin Shepard's doing now? He's a coach somewhere, Miami. He's a coach. He's, I think he's, he's a, a coach, coach at LSU, right? He's coaching somewhere, but he's a coach. He's no longer playing football. Jerry Hughes, I didn't realize as I put this on Twitter the other day, Jerry Hughes had not missed a game until week 17 of this year when they rested him. Jerry Hughes played in 127 consecutive games since that trade, and he has been a the whole time at minimum above replacement level player. He had a couple of 10 sack seasons in there, you know, and he morphed himself when he first came in. I remember that first year in that Mike Pedden defense where he was kind of that uh, kind of like that sub, that kind of situational pass rusher who didn't get a ton of snaps, but got, I think, 10 sacks out of just kind of being in the right spot at the right time. And then just kind of morphed himself through Rex Ryan defenses and Jim Schwartz defenses and now Sean McDermott defenses. And you look at what he is now to this team and just being a, a leader and being, you know, I just I think a really important part of this defense and really probably, you know, I, I out of everyone on this team, I, I'm, I think I'm really glad that he got to stick around and see the fruits of this labor that, you know, the bills put in for so many years during the drought. So I, I have a soft part in my heart for Jerry Hughes. I think that's gotta be the best trade they've, they've made since, since yeah. 2000. And and the thing is, so Kelvin Shepard is actually now, he was an administrator, a director of player development at LSU, but he's now the outside linebackers coach for the Detroit Lions. So he's out there biting kneecaps uh, this <laughs> offseason. Um, but every, every, every other year or every couple of years, the Buffalo Bills draft a linebacker like in the middle rounds. It absolutely breaks my heart, whether it's Kelvin Shepard or, uh, you know, Reggie Light, Ragland, Alvin Bowen, Keith Ellison going back into the day. So it's it's nice that the Buffalo Bills turned one of those putrid middle round uh, early to, to, to middle round linebackers into something significant. And yeah, in terms of in terms of, you know, the top 20 move or the top moves or the top trades or free agent signings of the past 20 years. Even though maybe Jerry Hughes hasn't had the like like he's had a major impact on this team. Don't get me wrong, especially in those Jim Schwartz years. But even though he's not like the crazy position like a quarterback and even though he hasn't been like, a you know, a Miles Garrett or a Bosa type of pass rusher like that, that major impact type of pass rusher, just the lopsidedness of that deal puts it like straight up in the top five. Like there's no question about it. 
Right, no, Hughes has been a great player in his own right for the Bills. I think he's a guy that may even have his name on the Wall of Fame for the for, for you know at the Bills Stadium. But the fact that Kelvin Shepard, who was a guy that you know has turned out to be really, I mean, at this point, he's like you guys have been saying, he's a coach. I mean, right, the lopsidedness of that trade is just truly remarkable, and it feels good. It felt good to be on the other end of that because it seemed like the Bills got burned so many times on trades in the past, and to have a Finally, like a clear, you know, advantage, and it, I know as a fan, at least, felt real good. And his growth has been fun. It, well, you know, it wasn't long ago that, you know, it, I, I forget what player gave him the gave him the um his alter ego, Gary Hughes, when he's out on the field. I forget who who gave him that name, but it wasn't long ago that like he was a guy who was always getting personal foul or you know, fifteen yard penalties, and he's really in the last few years become, I think, a much better leader on the field and a lot more controlled leader on the field so much that he has a cap and patch now which is something that you know i I just think his Mm -hmm. constant development as a person and a player has just been incredibly admirable admirable admirable. all right so these first two picks were in the trenches and i respect that building from the inside out um but i'm gonna go for i'm gonna go for the flash now i'm gonna go for the substance and with the third overall pick i'm taking the stefan diggs trade uh, so I'm going Stefan Diggs for a one. I know that Jamar Jefferson is, is, you know, had a good career, but I mean, Stefan Diggs is the player that elevated this team from wild card playoff team to AFC championship game. Like if you look at it, this is the guy who has elevated the town on this team. He is, he, he, you know, he's, he's part of the Jordan brand now with Nike getting that, that, uh, that deal with Nike. You, you see the way he trains in the off season. Like this guy is just absolutely built different. He brought a personality. He brought a work ethic. He brought a, just, a, just an aura around him that this franchise was missing. And, um, you know, he's one of these players that when we do win a Super Bowl, we're going to look back at it and say, that was one of the deals that won a Super Bowl. So, uh, I'm going to go with Stefan Diggs, number three overall, which I think is a massive steal here. No offense. No, I mean, listen, it, it, it was the perfectly timed move, really, by Brandon Bean. I mean, they, they knew it going into the offseason. That was the piece this team was missing. And again, not even the production he brought on the field, but, you you know, that Deion Dawkins Player Tribune article where he talked about, like, just how competitive and how – and just that mindset that, that Diggs brings into the facility each and every day was something that they didn't realize they needed until they saw it. So not only the fact that this is a guy who, I mean, led the NFL in – receptions and receiving yards and helped our quarterback develop into an MVP kind of caliber player, but he really elevated the entire team top to bottom on that roster, both sides of the ball. And for that, it's kind of hard to put a price on that really. So yeah, no Diggs trade was, was truly fantastic. And during, and, and it's one of those things that it, I, we've never really had that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm 25. So I, I grew up on drought football. Like I, I didn't watch playoff football until I was 22 and in grad school. We never had a guy like that. You know, we had T.O. for a minute on the back end of his career, but we never had a true alpha number one wide receiver that you saw like guys getting 1,200, 1,300 yards a year like Diggs got. And I think it's the ultimate, ultimate testament to McDermott's and Bean's culture that they built that a guy who had the reputation of being a diva and, and being a problem child and all this stuff came in and just fit in and immediately just elevated everything and immediately all those narratives of him being this that and the other thing went out the window so it just i really like outside of maybe some uh, trades that may end up later on here i won't spoil my list you know uh, really a franchise altering move especially Mm -hmm. if they're able to lock them down long term in the next year or two speaking of franchise altering there's no more uh, there's no more position in the National Football League that's franchise altering than the quarterback position. And my next pick is not going to be a quarterback. But what's the most important thing to a quarterback's development when you have a young quarterback that you draft? Maybe a a raw quarterback who has played at a small school like Wyoming, who is known for uh, not being able to throw the ball underneath and be inaccurate. Well, Wide receiver is pretty darn important. And while Stefan Diggs, the alpha receiver, was so important to Josh Allen this season, I think one of the reasons why Josh Allen has developed into the quarterback he is is because of my next pick. And that is going to be double down on the wide receivers, free agency, not a trade, 2019, Cole Beasley. And just like I said before, the quarterback is the most important part of your franchise. And the Buffalo Bills did Josh Allen dirty in his rookie year. 
Andre Holmes, Calvin Benjamin, Jeremy Curley. Uh, finally, they brought in Isaiah McKenzie and had Robert Foster. They kind of lucked out with those two guys later on the season. They did him real dirty, and they they realized what they had done that offseason, and they went about and they fixed it the right way. Obviously not throwing smoke into this equation, but they went out and they got a guy like Cole Beasley, that veteran, that guy who works the middle of the field, that guy who has built a trust and a relationship with Josh Allen, the guy who has probably – more effectively turn him into an underneath passer and helped his completion percentage more than anything, more than any coach, more than any anything. I think Cole Beasley has had that kind of impact on Josh Allen. So I'm going to go with the development of the quarterback who's eventually going to win us the Super Bowl, and I'm going to double down on wide receiver with Cole Beasley here. Yeah, I, I think that's a great one. I think that whole offseason, there's there's multiple moves that offseason that you could really put up on, on that list. And, you know, I, I think it, Against again, a lot of this list is a testament to McDermott and Bean being smart with their resource and knowing that, hey, we don't need to go out and sign a $20 million wide receiver. We can get this cast away from Dallas. And, you know, just, and I think Dable's ability to put guys in positions to be them best selves. And I think the last two seasons of this offense have been a testament to that, putting guys like Kim, Beasley, Davis, John Brown, all in positions that they can express themselves and, and their traits come out the best. And, you know, it really it uh, has been a, a glue piece really in this offense. Yeah. Can't, can't hate that. And uh, yeah, he, you know, he, the respect he has from the teammates too. I mean, I, I, you know, we'll never truly know, but it seems like he's also such a leader in the locker room as well, aside from even developing Josh Allen. So no, he Beasley was a great pick and, and a great pickup for the bills. Cause he's really, he was the player that was never supposed to work with Josh Allen, and yet it, it worked so perfectly. And uh, yeah, really got to tip your hat to them on that one. All right. So with the second pick, with my second pick in the best players, best signing and, and uh, draft or draft or best signings and trades draft, I have number two on my big board still available. So this is working out great for me. I have trading up and getting franchise quarterback. Josh Allen in. Oh, I didn't know that was something we could do. All trading, right. trade. It's a trade. A trade, a trade, and then a draft. But you, you know, you know what? I have a couple of loopholes in mind too. So you're good. I think trading up to get Josh Allen is a franchise altering pick. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot I need to say about it. I besides the fact that I think the gut. I think the guts and the I to take a guy who I think. In, in in least media circles and I think a lot of you know scout circles was viewed as you know uh, you know you look back to that Jason Kirk article the Bills think they can outsmart math or whatever that title was it always gets passed around mm -hmm. you know I, I think the confidence to see a guy like that and move up and I think and moving on from a guy like who was a decent an okay quarterback in Tyrod Taylor to take a risk on that I, I think always impressed me that that they were they push their chips in like that instead of just riding the middle with what they had at quarterback there so i think i think uh leveraging the future trading up and getting josh allen i, I that that was my number two and i i guess i should have been more clear on the rules but that's what i the 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 name of the article by the way was uh if josh allen succeeds the bills will have outsmarted basically all regular humans and the entirety of math itself which was just a great uh, the probably the best thing fan sided has ever done, by the way. Um, but uh, but besides that, uh, I mean, you're spot on. I mean, I hated the pick. I, I the, the we picked the wrong Josh. Was that's the, what I screamed. I screamed the that. words were, were coming out of my mouth for for two months after. And like every typical Bills fan, I went back and I watched his senior. I didn't even watch any of his Wyoming highlights. I refused. Like I to this day have seen very few Josh Allen Wyoming highlights just because I didn't want to watch it because from what I heard from some people like it wasn't pretty. I only watched his senior book <laughs> and he had a really good senior ball and I was like, OK, looks legit. Um, but uh, I mean, the the chance that the Bills took on a guy that literally I think only Mel Kuyper thought was worth a damn is absolutely insane. And if you look back and you redraft that draft, Josh Allen's number one with a bullet. And Mel Kuyper was even saying before the draft, like kudos to Mel, um, because, you know, Mel's had a lot of misses over the last couple of years. And, you know, a lot of people like to make fun of him over the Jimmy Clausen stuff. Uh, and the whole entirety of, 
of draft media has evolved like crazy since Mel Kuyper started because he was just the OG. But I mean, he said it. He said the Cleveland Browns should have taken Josh Allen number one. And he's been he said that from day one. And he was correct. You know, we talk about the Cleveland Browns as a threat to us right now. Imagine if their quarterback was Josh Allen and not Baker Mayfield. Um, like that would have been absolutely crazy. I think if Josh Allen went number one, we could have been talking about maybe Sam Darnold as our starting quarterback or Baker Mayfield as our starting quarterback. So that's just a crazy thing to think about. But the Buffalo Bills took a chance that no one else was willing to take. And they 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 screwed up in the beginning, like I mentioned, with the Kelvin Benjamins and Andre Holmes of the world and the stuff. And they didn't have another quarterback there to properly groom him uh to start because he was not a guy you could just throw out there right away but year two sean mcdermott he hit that reset he brought in brian dable and kudos to brian dable because i said from day one why aren't we using josh allen more like we are using um more like like baltimore's using lamar like use his legs be funky with it design an offense around josh allen that wasn't brian dable's mindset from day one brian dable was like here, Josh, this is what NFL quarterbacks do. Go out and do it. Sink or swim. Like, it's up to you. You're either going to sink or you're going to swim. You're either going to succeed as an NFL quarterback or you're going to fail as an NFL quarterback. I'm not going to cater things to you. And it worked because you see now in Baltimore, everyone's like, well, is Lamar a legit NFL quarterback or is he not? Greg Roman's been tailoring that offense to his strengths and ignoring his weaknesses for so long. Whereas Brian Dable has taken those Josh Allen weaknesses and turned them into strength. So kudos to the Bills for building around him and all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, biggest transaction in Bills history since drafting Jim Kelly, 100%. And I want to focus even not just specifically on what Josh Allen has been as a player, but how about how Brandon Bean was able to climb up the draft boards to get him by making that first trade up for like with Cordy Glenn to the Bengals and then packaging picks and the way he manipulated, you know, as we've now come so so used to seeing the way he was able to work with the board and work with his assets to get to go up to get Josh Allen for a team that was also coming off a playoff appearance, drafting the back half of the first round. I think that also can't be, uh, you know, understated enough how important that was because I don't know if every GM in the NFL could have made those moves and 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 been able to put themselves even in the position yeah. to get Josh Allen. And of course, on top of that, they I mean, no question. He picked the right quarterback. I mean, it just like you guys. I mean, I was very upset when they made that trade. You know, that <laughs> pick. I was, I was a really big Josh Rosen guy, embarrassingly so. But, um, but yeah, no, that that was from top to bottom. I mean, really, I think it was after seeing that pick pan out, everything with it. That's when I really gave this regime my full faith, my full trust, because they they knew what they wanted. They knew what they were mm-hmm. doing from the very, you know, second that offseason started, and they had their plan. They didn't back down and. It was really just a um, you know an amazing execution by the Bills front and, office. And before this season, when Josh Allen turned himself into an MVP, the conversation that some people were having just just amusing, just like an off season chatter. Look like what what me and Bills what what we and Bills Mafia like to do. They were like, well, if Josh Allen doesn't pan out, does Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott get another stab at a quarterback? And the answer was re- a resounding yes by most people because the roster they built around Josh Allen. You think about going up into the top ten to grab a franchise quarterback you got to give up multiple firsts, like firsts, you know, three years worth of firsts. You have to give up your franchise, and then you can't build around that quarterback. You mentioned the way Brandon B maneuvered that board. At the end of the day, they gave up what? A first-round pick and two second-round picks? Like, they didn't give up a lot to move up and grab Josh Allen. They didn't mortgage their future to where if Josh Allen would have failed, I think a lot of people with the roster they built and the lack of assets they gave up for that quarterback probably would have given this regime another shot at drafting a quarterback or bringing in a quarterback just because of how few assets the Buffalo Bills gave up for Josh Allen in comparison to what other franchises have to give up for their franchise quarterback. It, it, it's almost kind of like the Bears almost, except the Bears gave up a lot to get up that one pick, but it's so much of the fact that they have a really good run. They had a really good roster and everything besides a quarterback, and that's probably why Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy have got to stick around for one more quarterback because the rest of that roster and that defense has been so successful and able to get them to a couple playoff berths mm-hmm. that, that, you know, it's, I, to, it's not to, just quarterback to me, Ryan Pace's ass and Matt Nagy's ass should have been out of there because well, yeah. like, like, beca- like no offense, like the bills took the bills had a choice between Josh Allen and Josh Rosen. And they took, and I guess Lamar too. And they took Josh Allen. 
Ryan Pace took Money Mitch, number two <laughs> overall, over to Sean Watson and Patrick Mahomes. Like, that, that's bad. That's real bad. Yes, a little bit different circumstances, but <laughs> I think that's probably why they get at least the, the, yeah. the playoff berth. The playoff berth is probably why they've maybe undeservedly so gotten to stick around. Yeah. All right. So uh, with the second pick, oof. So I I had a couple other things on my board here that I liked. You know, I, I'm gonna go with this one. This is a I'm sure a move that a lot of people are expecting someone to take. I'm gonna take it now. Similar to the Jerry Hughes trade, this trade was just straight up so lopsided, and it, I'm going to have to go with Shady for Kiko Alonso. That trade, one of the best moves that Doug Whaley ever made, and I mean, I know after that move, I was all in on the Bills, you know, going to the playoffs with the Rex Ryan years, and despite the shortcomings of Rex Ryan and that defense and how Whaley was never able to get a quarterback, well, Sean McCoy was a thousand-yard rusher. Uh, you know, several times with the Bills. He had that one year in 2016 where he was truly, I mean, if you go back and look at his stats in that year, you forget how dominant he was on that, that, that season. I mean, he brought some real superstar name and ability to the Bills, which was refreshing to see from, you know, having someone that the whole country knew who LaShawn McCoy was. And outside of that, he was just so fun to watch. I mean, the, the jukes he put on guys, the, 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 the special plays he had, were so fun. So, and on top of that, Kiko Alonso turned out to, you know, as much as we all loved him after his rookie year, he was never the same after he tore up his knee. So that trade was just too lopsided for me to pass. I'm going uh, shady for Kiko. And what what I like about that move is, and, and no offense to Mario, but Mario Williams, remember when Mario Williams signed, he's like, I just like it, you know, quiet. I like to hunt like Jim Kelly was in on the recruiting. Like he was a really quiet, like he was like, even though it was a splashy move, he wasn't a splashy player. He wasn't the star player face of the league. Like LaShawn McCoy was, I think LaShawn McCoy went a long way to re-legitimizing the franchise because I, I love the city of Buffalo. I love, 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 I love. I think we might have lost you, Judge. I don't know if it was just on my end. Yeah. No, no, I, I, did you get the repeating? Yeah, me too. Here, hold on. Yeah, I got, I got frozen, Judge. Here, I can remove Judge and then add him back, maybe? Hold on, I'll text him real quick. All right, I'm going to remove him, um, and then uh, hopefully, and then once he can probably hop back in in a minute. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess I could I could keep talking here for a little bit, or I don't know if Randy, if you have any thoughts on that, I guess, for right now, it's a little crazy here. Well, he, he was on a good, he was, I, I liked where he was going. I'll give him a second to see if, okay, he, okay. if, he, if he wants to jump back in on that thought. Right, right, and right. Kind of trim it that way. Exactly. Are you in like uh is it like a party going on there? No, okay, so I'm in a so I'm living in a hostel and I'm in this like lounge. Oh. And for some reason they play this music over the loudspeaker 24/7 nonstop. And like so I've been doing some stuff like on Zoom with like my internship and they're like, "Oh, you like is there like some live music there?" I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> so I'm trying that's why I've been muted when I haven't been talking. Yeah. So like try to mask over and try to talk over best I can, but yeah, it's it's like just loud enough where it's kind of annoying, you know, because you're like, oh, I just want to like sit here and do some work. Um, so so well. they, ha- they have you staying in a hostel for the whole internship. Yeah, basically, I'm living in like a dorm room with a bathroom attached to it. Essentially, it's not it's actually not a bad hostel. It's kind of nice. But oh, here we go. I think we got judge back in here. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. My computer literally just decided midstream to update. So I don't know why. That oh, OK, but we can I, I can. I can just pick up where I left off and then I can, yeah. uh, I can yeah, yeah. flip the things together. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. you were on a good but what, there. Mm-hmm. But what was I, LaShawn McCoy? Yeah, you, I'll just, talking, I'll just go back. The city and... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just go back to like where I started. All right. 
awkwardness, but I'm going to restart. <laughs> um, yeah, no offense to, you know, Ralph Wilson Jr., the city of Buffalo, all that stuff. But this franchise was like an absolute joke in the final years of Ralph Wilson Jr. I mean, the stadium was a dump. We had a guy who wasn't a football guy in Russ Brand and running things. Ralph was just out of it um, in the last couple of years. Um, you know, some of his press conferences weren't the best. Like this was literally a poverty franchise. Like we in in Buffalo like to look at it in, you know, rose colored glasses because we're fans of Buffalo. But I mean, we almost lost our NFL team and we probably deserve to do so for some aspects of those those five or six years. Now, things are better now. And I think LaShawn McCoy was a big part in re-legitimizing the franchise. Mario Williams was great and all, but he was like a small town guy. He liked to to hunt. Jim Kelly was a big part of the recruiting process, and he just wasn't the star, the face of the league like LaShawn McCoy was. LaShawn McCoy didn't want to come to Buffalo, came to Buffalo, loved it here, and he put up some numbers here, and he was still able to be one of the faces of the league while he was here. So I think he was a big part in re-legitimizing this franchise and getting this franchise back on sort of the world stage of the, of the National Football League, um, a, a place where it hadn't been in a really long time. So... What a big move that was for Buffalo, adding a guy like LaShawn McCoy. I think, you know, guys like Micah Hyde, um, I think guys like Stephon Diggs, all of those guys that sort of Cole Beasley, John Brown. I think LaShawn McCoy probably had a lot to do with re-legitimizing re the franchise, and it was able to help us make some of those additions that we made in future years. LaShawn McCoy is a Hall of Fame running back who, at least for a couple years here, played Hall of Fame level football. Like, how many times can you really remember LaShawn McCoy having a negative yard run he oh even when those plays blew up and he had some bleed that you know plays that blew up behind the line of scrimmage he found his way back to the line of scrimmage and got a yard like he was a human highlight tape and you know he wasn't quite what he was in some of those early Philly days but man he was just electric and I, I think a home run threat in the backfield that we haven't had since mm -hmm. And, you know, I always loved his personality. I know he had some off the field stuff that he ended up getting cleared from, um, cleared on, but he was just, his personality was he just like, he just liked to party without women, like without, <laughs> he liked to party with only women, you know, so there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and don't, <laughs> don't take, don't take a man champagne when they're at a, at the club. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, he was just a fun dude. And I, I think he also had a role in Josh Allen's development on the very end. You know, I, I mm -hmm. think that that one press conference that I think sticks out in a lot of people's mind is the one where he's talking about where he's talking about Josh Allen, that like he doesn't have to, to talk super fast all the time and that he can slow down and helping him, I think, become a, you know, he didn't ha really have, like you said, he didn't really have that veteran presence until Derek Anderson and, and um, who else, Matt Barkley came in that mm -hmm. year but I think having LaShawn McCoy a veteran running back who had played with guys like Donovan McNabb and and you know guys like that I I think definitely he played an important role in that and I I always have a, a soft spot in my heart mm -hmm. and I think you hit the I think you have to hit the nail on the head that that he really he legit he made Buffalo cool at least cooler than it was and, you know, he, he, he was just I, I could watch shady highlights all day. He He's just a fun as hell, oh, yeah. dude. I mean, you you look at this offense now last season, last season. What did everyone want? Everyone wanted like a big run. And outside of like Devin Singletary's garbage time, 65 yarder versus the Broncos. What was this offense missing? A running back who could take it to the house from anywhere on the football field. I mean, some of this guy's runs like you go like you go back and watch those those highlight films, whether it's like San Francisco or the L.A. Chargers or whatever. Like this dude's just house in it from anywhere he wants on the football field. And that's like a dynamic that this offense currently that we as fans were like, man, that's what we want. Like we got spoiled with shady, right? And now you got guys like Zach Moss and Devin Singletary who could be quality NFL running backs. They're never going to be shady. They're never going to be shady. So we're always going to look at running backs, at least in the near future within the prism of, are they shady? And they're not. <laughs> so it's, it's a tough act for Buffalo running backs to follow. Yeah. And one last quick thing before we move on here. Also, why I took LaShawn McCoy here is me and Ryan have talked about it a little bit. And, you know, LaShawn McCoy is also a guy like, you know, me and Ryan, like guys talk a little shit on the field and kind of let their presence, you know, let the guys know that they're here. And like having LaShawn McCoy, a guy that went back down from anybody that could back up his smack and like that had that just dog mindset, you know, was something that 
the offense didn't – I mean, I can't remember through the drought era the Bills ever really having a player with kind of like mm-hmm. that swag other than maybe Stevie Johnson. So mm-hmm. having LaShawn McCoy be kind of that presence on the field um, that we sort of were talking about with, with Diggs a little bit, um, I think I think made him – you know, he brought he – brought, again, he brought some swagger to Buffalo. And on top of that, too, Josh Allen's got that swagger now, right? So, like – Maybe LaShawn McCoy in the early days, he was one of the first guys that he had a touchdown celebration with, right? He had the handshakes and stuff with Shady. So maybe some of that swagger, maybe some of that dog attitude that Josh Allen carries on the football field with him every week, maybe some of that was fostered and incubated in the early, in the early, in his early career with LaShawn McCoy. So maybe we have LaShawn McCoy to thank for uh, that epic uh, forever will live in history, uh, you know, NFL films video of the referee going up to Sean McDermott and saying, Hey, tell your boy to chill. And then Sean, what did Sean McDermott say to Josh Allen? Like, I like the uh, swagger, Dan. I like the swagger. (laughs) (laughs) So we got, maybe we got LaShawn McCoy to thank for that. Uh, All right. So I think, I think I have the next pick, right? Yep. All right. So this is definitely a little tough for me now. A couple, a couple guys, you know, some of you guys picked some trades and signings I had in mind. Um, you know what? I'm I'm gonna go with this one though because I do think that at the end of the day, even though this was before my time, I think you two, I think you in particular, Judge, are gonna really appreciate this pick because this was a guy who was, uh, really did you know his his influence on the fan base is still talked about today. Doug Flutie, I mean, t- everyone had forgotten about him. He was old. He was undersized. Everything you want. And the guy came in. And led the Bills to two playoff appearances and should have played. I mean, say what you want. There's no doubt he should have been playing on that and that you know wild card game against the Titans. But be careful. You know, Judge is a Rob is a Rob Johnson. Really, player. Judge. Oof, oof. All right. But listen, the Flutie Flakes. I was young which, and impressionable. All right. All right. All right. I, I I I can let it slide. I can let it slide. But from the Flutie Flakes, which has led to Josh Jackson. I mean, and 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 just what a perfect fit. Like an under, you know, an, a a guy who was undersized. A total underdog in the perfect city, right? Mm-hmm. Who embraces that mindset, and the whole story itself is just so it's so cool. It's still you know something that people talk about. So finally today, and we're talking now. You know, it's been t- almost twenty five years since Doug Flutie strapped up for the Bills, and he's still so beloved. So even though he's before my time, I think I was like a few months old at the Music City Miracle uh, as as just a young baby, but. Uh, uh, I feel like Doug Flutie, that, that signing just brought so much uh, influence to the fan base, and he's just yeah. forever going to be beloved by Bills fans. I mean, you talk about players that embody Buffalo. It's Josh Allen now. Uh, it, it, it was Kyle Williams. It was Lorenzo Alexander. It was Fred Jackson. Um, you know, Doug Flutie was one of the first of those players, those underdog players to really embody uh, the city of Buffalo. And I was too young, as I mentioned, and impressionable to to understand that. I like the cool hip California quarterback and Rob Johnson coming in with the flowing hair and the headbands. Like that was my dude. Um, I, I'll never forget the story. Cause like I was, I was, I was a Rob Johnson guy. Uh, I was that asshole, uh, but I was also uh, 10 years old. So whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember a Halloween one year. I wanted to be Rob Johnson for Halloween. So my parents got me a Rob Johnson Jersey and he always wore those, uh, those white sleeves. And I thought it was so cool. And I didn't own um, like a white, like not a lot of people own those, those shirts back in the day, like those Under Armour, like those dry fit, like that stuff, like that, that wasn't really a big thing back then. He was, he was one of the first guys that I, that I remember wearing those. Um, so I took a pair of my mom's white pantyhose and I just cut the leg that cut the feet off and I wore the pantyhose over my arms, uh, on, you know, and then they put the Jersey over it. Uh, and I just felt like the shit walking around on Halloween that year. I felt so cool. Um, and I was like, why are all these people booing me? Why are all these people calling me go fuck myself? Like I'm 10 years old. Why are these people talking to me like this? And it was because Doug Flutie embodied the city of Buffalo. I mean, my first, my first real memory of, of the Buffalo bills was that Jacksonville Jaguars game in 97, where Doug Flutie rolled out. Um, he rolled out left, you know, across his body, ran into the touchdown for the game winner against the Jaguars. And my dad was a season ticket holder. Um, you know, in the, I think he started being a season ticket holder, like 96, 97 after the Super Bowl years. And I just remember like after that play, like sitting at the, sitting at the door, waiting for my dad to come home so we could talk about how cool Doug Flutie was and how cool that touchdown was and how legit the Buffalo Bills were. And I mean, you go back and watch some of those highlights, you know, Eric Molds, Andre Reed, Thurman Thomas, 
just like Jim Kelly before him, he brought out the best in some of those players and just the plays he made were so electric. Um, you know, this, he is most definitely a player. This fan base will never forget because he embodied that city of Buffalo. And I think he hit the nail on the head with, with people still talking about him and being an influence. Cause I mean, I, I think he's a guy who was ahead of his time with a lot of that stuff too. Right. Like mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of running quarterbacks back then. Right. It, it, you know, you had Warren moon, you had Randall, you know, um, Randall Cunningham. And even then, you know, they weren't guys who were, they weren't Michael Vick. They weren't Doug Flutie, you know, got, you know, it, back then there weren't a ton of guys who could, you know, wrote who were throwing off platform and doing, making yeah. funky throws and like Doug Flutie's before my time. But, you know, some of the stuff that I watch of him, just, you know, funky arm angle stuff, you know, throwing on the run. It, it's just, it's stuff that's commonplace now, but even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it wasn't that common, let alone in 97, 98, 99. Yeah. And I think you could also argue, um, and not only for the running quarterback, but he kind of helped pave the way for this wave of undersized quarterbacks we're seeing too. Because you remember, I mean, Kyler and Baker Mayfield going one and two. I mean, people talked about how, you know, 20 years ago, you would have never taken a quarterback under 6'2, six, 6'3 six, in the first round. And Flutie being as little as he was kind of showed that, you know, hey, like undersized quarterbacks can be good in the NFL. So I think not only as, as far as mobility, but as truly an undersized player, he also kind of paved the way for these kind of shorter quarterbacks that we are now seeing flood the NFL. So for my second, for my last pick, I I have a couple, I had a couple more higher up on my board of like guys that were being McDermott moves, but hearing Judge talk about legitimizing the city and bringing a cool player back to the city made me pick, go a little bit further down my board for a guy who maybe didn't have a massive impact when he was here, but for eighth grade Ryan, who didn't ever see a star come to Buffalo, my pick, my third and final pick is going to be signing Terrell Owens. I, I know that it was a one year thing. I know that he only had, I think eight, 900 yards, something like that. It wasn't a monster year. But like Judge said, for a team for those late 2000, early 2010 teams were horrid. They didn't have there was no superstars on that team. You know, we had Lynch for a minute. Like there was just there was no one on that. You know, back when I watched all old school sports center all the time, they didn't talk about the Bills. They didn't go to Bills training camp. Like that's not something you saw. And bringing in Terrell Owens, who you know, I don't know if there's quite stars like Terrell Owens in football in terms of the wide receiver position anymore. Terrell Owens was a megastar across, you know, many teams. And for me in eighth grade, seeing Terrell Owens come to Buffalo and enjoy it and embrace it. And, you know, some of it got some of it is kind of Mimi looking back with the giving and the key to the city and all that stuff. But it, for me, it was just a really, really cool experience going to training camp and trying to see T.O. And, you know, I so that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go T.O. It might not be the popular, might not be the best, but uh, I, at a nostalgic level, I, I really enjoyed having T.O. as a Buffalo Bill, even for just one year. No, yeah, I can get. Oh, sorry. Uh, go oh, ahead, man. Judge. Go ahead. You want me to I, go? Okay. Yeah, you can go. Okay. No, no, I can get behind that. I mean, I remember as I think I was maybe 10 when they made that move or 11 and my, I asked my parents immediately for my birthday for a Terrell Owens Jersey. Like I, I kind of remember that. And you know, he actually really was a pretty solid player despite kind of being on the back nine of his career. But like you said though, it was fun to actually be in the national spotlight. Cause that was something that was being tracked. So oh, is Terrell Owens going to Buffalo? Is that actually happening? So he was fun. And for what it's worth, he didn't he say in an interview recently or within the last year that playing in Buffalo and with Ryan Fitzpatrick was like one of his favorite years of his career, which mm. for a team that also was horrible, that fired, I think they fired Dick Geron in the middle of that season, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Like the fact that he even said that, hey, playing in Buffalo with Fitz was truly one of the best seasons he had in his career and most fun. I think that, um, you know, kind of like almost validated, like, yeah, you know what? Say what you want about the Bills during that time, but at least that was a fun little era they had between the two of them. And yeah, I mean, another little personal story here that that year was also the 50 year anniversary of the Buffalo Bills. Yep. And they were playing in the Hall of Fame game that year. 
And uh, I was actually at that game. That was one of the games where I think uh, uh, Tennessee was wearing the Houston Oilers jerseys and, and they like faked a punt and they like, yes, behind the st- back. It was behind yeah. the back. They like steamrolled us in that game. It wasn't the funnest game in the world, but I just want to like pause for a moment and let the world know that the greatest uniform matchup in the history of the National Football League occurred not in the regular season, but in the preseason that year when the Tennessee Titans were wearing the Houston Oiler powder blue throwbacks and the Buffalo Bills were wearing that all white standing Buffalo 50th anniversary uh, jersey. And Terrell Owens rocking that 81 in that 50 and 50th anniversary all white throwback jersey was just fucking lit. Like it was like you were just like you were just like, oh my God, that that's real. That's Terrell Owens in the most badass uniform I've ever seen in my entire life. Like it was insane. That entire game was insane. The Bills fans took over Canton, the fanfare, like TO, like slapping hands and stuff in the stands. It was just absolutely nuts. I know, I think we overdid it. Like, I think that's peak Buffalo, like overreacting to things because T.O. was on the far side of his career and he got the key to the city and it was all these weird different things. Like literally no one else wanted the dude. Um, Buffalo was his only choice, but it was still freaking cool. Like it was still like if we're going to suck, we might as well suck while also like getting to see some cool shit. And like that 98 uh, Jacksonville again, that 98 yarder from Fitz to T.O. uh, Pretty awesome. Uh, And some of the other uh, things pretty awesome. And I think. Uh, Stevie Johnson talked with Rico about how he got a lot of his swagger and stuff from playing with T.O. So, um, yeah, it was just it was if you're going to suck, at least suck in style. And we suck in style that year. And you remember I remember that game, too, the, uh, that the refs had those red uniforms on and the funky hats. Oh, yeah, it was uh, it was a it was a sight to see. It was. Yeah, it was a whole thing. And, you know, it it, it was just it. And that was the, I think it was the first year I had season tickets. So I may mm-hmm. have been a freshman in high school then. And like, he had some highlight plays. Like he had, you know, the Trent. I remember the Trent Edwards catch against Tampa Bay and, you know, that end around versus Houston. Like he still brought some electricity. And I remember him, I was at that last game that he played. That was against the, where Payne Manning only came in and played one game, one drive or something like that against the Colts. Mm-hmm. And then the bill, I think they got when they got Fred Jackson, like 250 yards so he can get a thousand yards and him like he, he walked after that game. He was running around the field and waving the bills flag. And, you know, it was just something that, like you said, making a, a team that was really a horrid team a, a little bit more exciting, a little bit more legitimate. All right. So that leaves me with the final pick. Am I correct? Yep. All right, since it's the last pick and I have so many names still on my list, I'm going to run you through all the ones I'm not picking. Okay. Uh, how about Lorenzo Alexander in 2016 off the scrap heap? I had on in, my list. I thought about that one too. Yeah, revitalizing his career. He was one of the guys who, um, you know, probably even though he revitalized his career under Rex Ryan, everyone thought when Sean McDermott came to town with the 43, he was done. He'd go back to being a special teamer. Nope. I mean, he revitalized his career again. And became a guy who could drop back into cover. Like literally, the guy started his career as a defensive tackle. Like it's absolutely the career arc of Lorenzo Alexander, and and again, one of those Buffalo guys is just absolutely insane. Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. If I could combine the two, they'd probably be my pick here. I was um, going back and forth between that. Um, the reason why I didn't pick either of them is because I didn't I didn't want to pick one and not the other. So I'm gonna yeah. leave them both off. Um, so Micah Hyde there. Uh, and Jordan Poyer, those guys who really allow Sean McDermott to do what he wants to do on this defense that has resurrected this buffalo team um london fletcher in 2002 really good free agent signing again a guy who left the rams undersized linebacker went to washington had even more career success could he be a hall of famer i think so um takio spikes was another really cool one uh even though injuries sort of limited his impact um drew bledsoe in 2002 as well super cool um, got to watch him throw the football over the field. One of my favorite seasons as a Buffalo Bills fan was the back half of that season where we started 0 and 4, then like absolutely curb stomp people the rest of the year and then lost to Willie Parker and Tommy Maddox. I mean, the fake, the fake, the fake, uh, the fake quarterback sneak and then the throwback to Willis McGahee, the way Shane Matthews would come in every quarter, every fourth quarter because JP Lossman was hurt and um, Drew Bledsoe had curb stomp teams for the first three quarters, just thrown all over him. Like the Buffalo Bills won a ton of games this year, like lopsidedly, the San Francisco game, the, the, the Miami game, the New England game. Like it was a lot of fun this year. Buffalo wasn't curb stomping people like that since that Drew Bledsoe team back then. It was just fun. It was sort of mad and ask. Um, and another name I had on my list was Tyrod Taylor. I had to like 
here's the one thing I'll never understand. How did Sean McDermott and Tyrod Taylor not get along? I don't get it. Like, I'm not saying they hated each other, but Sean McDermott was actively trying to replace Tyrod Taylor from the day he got there. And I'll never understand that because to me, they both seem like guys who are wired the same way, like quiet, uh, humble, hardworking. Like those two seem like a match made in heaven. And from the day he got here, Sean McDermott was trying to get rid of Tyrod Taylor. It was, it was crazy to me. Um, but uh, he's the quarterback who broke the drought. At the end of the day, yeah. he's the quarterback who broke 17 years of non-playoff football. So he deserves credit for that. But that 2015 team was legitimately like a good offense. Oh yeah, with Percy and, and Hogan and Sammy, yeah. right, right, and Carlos and he, too. And yeah. he had a good deep ball. Like he had an arm. I think people forget about that. Like he could throw. Yeah. He, there were like five or six like deep balls that I remember that year to like Sammy and and those guys. Mm-hmm. I, I think Tyrod gets a lot of hate for for not for no good reason. All right, um, but there's one player who I can't not draft, and it was in 2016. The only good thing to come out of the Marv Levy era was there was a running back who played at Marv Levy's alma mater, Co College. He, uh, he, you know, he blew up NFL Europe. I think it was like the Barcelona Dragons or the Rain Fire, something like that. Uh, and then he came to Buffalo, and despite the fact that we had Marshawn Lynch, despite the fact that we drafted CJ Spiller, none of those first round pedigree running backs could ever live up to Fred Jackson, Mr. Buffalo himself, Fred Jackson. I want to say right now, my favorite player of all time, and that will never change. Josh Allen will never make Fred Jackson, not my favorite player. There is no player in the history of football that will ever step on a football field that will make me question the fact that Fred Jackson was the favorite player I've ever had watching football team. The joy he brought me while our team sucked was phenomenal. His story, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I will take this. I will take this take to my grave. If the Buffalo Bills would have just handed over the offense to Fred Jackson, he could have been so much bigger than he was. He could have been a star of this league. Some of the plays that that guy made, like I remember the Pittsburgh game where he caught that pass from Fitz and just went, took it almost to the house. And there was one year in the league between kick, punt, returns, running, and receiving. He led the league in in, in yardage, all purpose yards. He led the league. I like the he- dude could could do everything. He could do everything. And um, I think that one of the biggest mistakes the Bills made during the drought era was thinking that they could upgrade from Fred Jackson. Yep. Well, the story was that when they drafted CJ Spiller, I think Marshawn Lynch called him laughing because, or, yeah, Marshawn Lynch called Fred Jackson laughing because they he didn't think you know that they were trying to replace him after he had already had a really productive mm-hmm. career at that point. We want a water bug. So everyone's like, oh, they'll take a small shifty guy in the fifth round. They use the ninth overall pick in the draft on him. Unbelievable. Yeah, I I, I think I, Fred, Fred, Fred is hard to hate. Like, CJ's CJ's a nice guy. And like if Fred Jackson didn't exist, I sure I would I'm sure I would have loved CJ Spiller. Because CJ Spiller had some good years in, like in Buffalo. There was like a two year stretch when he actually managed to stay healthy, uh, where he played really well. Um, but no, I'm sorry. Like I completely irrationally dislike CJ Spiller because of Fred Jackson. Yeah, that, that that's totally fair. I mean, I, it, I, I think you hit the nail, Mr. Buffalo. He was, I think kind of the shiny light during all that. And, you know, to your point, they never really gave him the offense. The one year they did, I forgot what season it is, but there was a year that he started on pace for like, 1500 yards and, he got hurt. Wild, yeah. and then he, he broke his leg and he was there was people talking about him that year as an mvp candidate because mm-hmm. of all the work he was doing and a guy who was perfect for that chain Geely offense because he could catch passes on those screens and he had such good vision and man and he just looked he just looked cool like he yeah. just like the way he ran was cool the way like he was built like a little bigger at like six foot one two fifteen just the way he like it, he was just cool the way he fucking stiff armed Chris Conti at the goal line everything the man did was just awesome it was just awesome that Chris, that Chris Conti play might be one of the coolest plays ever when he <laughs> when he threw Chris Conti in that EJ Manuel game absolutely and you know I think and I think part of it's too is like I, I'm pretty sure he still lives in Buffalo no like I think yeah he, he he does the buff like he works for the Buffalo Bills. And he does the pregame and the postgame show on their website. Oh, I didn't know that. So yeah, so yeah. He's, he's still a guy that everyone's tuning into Rico after the game. That's why they don't <laughs> they don't they don't know if Fred Jackson's doing it, but he is. He, he's still a guy that that you know is just really was. I I think you ask for a face of that those drought teams, and I think Fred Jackson 
is the answer nine times out of ten. Mm -hmm. Him and Kyle. And Him I couldn't take Kyle because he was drafted. Yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> Fred, Fred Jackson, you know, real quick here. Fred Jackson, he he's the the one guy in those drought era teams that I really, really wish could still have been around for the Bills now, how good mm -hmm. they are, because that was a guy that he just would buckle up his chin strap, go to work each Sunday. And a dude who was just so easy to root for. Um, I I will forever love Fred Jackson. He, he he's one doubt undoubtedly on my top three or five all time Bills that I and I've watched. And I don't and, think he's gonna ever get off that list. He's he's just so so easy to root for. And like you said, just the dude was such a productive player that yet no one talked about. You know, mm -hmm. but the guy always always produced. He had the great you know I forget what the celebration was that he always did. Um, Just, uh, I think yeah, it was the, the Wolverine or something, or I, yeah. I, Superman. Oh, I, I can't remember. Yeah, exactly. It was, like a super, it was like a Hulk style Superman. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what it was. I think it was Hulk. You know, I just, yeah. He, he just, for, I'll forever love Fred Jackson. Yeah. I mean, speaking of UDFAs, you know who's one I forgot? Brian Mormon. Could we have put Brian Mormon on this list? You could have put Brian <laughs> speaking, of the drought, speaking of the drought, I had on my initial list when I was just running through, I had Ryan Lindell on. <laughs> He didn't make the he didn't make the top ten. Was there anything on your list, Mitch, that that you didn't get to? Um, I mean, a lot of the picks, a lot, a lot of the signings and, and, and trades uh, that you guys mentioned. The only two I thought about were Cornelius Bennett. I didn't want to talk about that too much, just because that was so before my time. But just kind of the the impact that move had, because that I mean, he came in and was so productive for the Bills and was such a good player and kind of pushed them to a real Super Bowl contender. And then I had these two together just simply because that, that these two players were even accepted by other teams in a trade was Russell Bodine and Marshall Newhouse. I still don't know how Brandon Bean traded those two guys <laughs> to this day. I, I can't understand how anyone really gave away assets for those two players. Uh, so those are the only two, I guess, honorable mentions that I had. The, yeah, the only two that I got that weren't talked about because I had some of the ones that Judge had on his list that he didn't pick because I had... I had uh, Richie Incognito, a guy that was on who, my initial top fifteen, yeah, who who was a castaway and came here and played well, and then somehow after everything that's happened, is still playing okay in mm -hmm. uh, Oakland. And then I had I had Tyrod Taylor on my list signing, and funny, right below that, I had trading Tyrod Taylor because I think that spurred a lot mm -hmm. of what was this rebuild and getting yeah. the assets and stuff like that. I'm curious. We're not. We don't. We're not going to do a worse draft. But what what were what are some signings or trades that you can think mm -hmm. of that if we did a if we did a worse if we did a worst of draft that you guys would have on your list? So I'll go first. I guess I'll I'll, I'll give you like two or three. I obviously I, I had Vontae Davis on there because I just I, I don't know how you can't. <laughs> uh, still to this day, I don't I don't think I'll ever hear a player retiring at halftime. And then I wanted to do one that maybe people forgot about, and this was right when I started like becoming a big Bills fan as a kid. Uh, no one remembers the awful contract that the Bills actually gave Dewan Edwards. Dewan Edwards, yes. They gave him like a four-year, $20 million deal, which at the time, that was a pretty hefty chunk of change to give to a, a D lineman. And he was just a rotational guy, and I think he gave him like maybe three sacks or something like that, which is not a good, not a good pickup. And I also, my last guy I had was a Mark Anderson. Who I had Mark I, Anderson. I, I love Mark Dude, Anderson. I that, thought he was going to be a beast. And the guy was so just he was nothing. Hurt. He was hurt. 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 But, yeah. I mean, that entire era is defined by like um, Derek Dockery. The guy who's on my list, Larry Triplett. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my Larry Triplett story in a little bit. Spencer Johnson, Robert Royal, like Mark Anderson. Like the bills were overpaying for just absolute duds forever. Before guys like Lee said, like LaShawn McCoy re legitimized this franchise, we were overpaying for duds. Uh, Robert Royal is the one that sticks out the most to me. Brad Smith was another one that we, we brought in to play Wildcat and just never did anything. But to me, Larry Triplett is the number one with, with a bullet because I still remember this day. Like, like I said, the best thing that Marv Levy ever did was he just was like, hey, this guy used to go to my college. It's a cool story. Let's sign him in Fred Jackson. Because no one else would have ever given Fred Jackson a shot. It was simply for the fact that he went to the same college as Marv Levy. Um, but I remember that offseason. We had some money to play with. And I'm like, yes, the Bills have some money to play with. Free agency as a Bills fan. This is the best time of year. We're hopeful. We're going to do something. And they signed Larry freaking triplet. Like the worst three technique defensive tackle I've ever seen in my entire life. The softest player I've ever seen 
Like, my God, the dude was an absolute teddy bear. Like, he just got mauled. Um, cause I remember for years that Colts defense, despite the fact that the Colts were good, the defense for the Colts was always pretty suspect. Like Gary Brackett, Larry Triplett, they had the two guys at the end in, uh, means and, um, Freeney and, and Bob Sanders and stuff, but it was always sort of a, a defense that got knocked around a little bit because the Colts were so prolific and we're like, we're going to go sign the softest guy on that defense and we're going to bring him here. And it was Larry Triplett and they completely overpaid. It was a joke. My the the one that the one that stings me the most to this day is, and I I think their hands were kind of forced, but trading Marshawn Lynch will always make me a little sad, mainly because Marsh outside of football, Marshawn Lynch is one of my all time favorite humans that exist on this earth, and even his highlights in Buffalo. Once again, when he was in Buffalo is when I first really started going to games in person and man, was he a monster? What am I? I think my second or third ever game in person was that Bengals game where he threw a pass and then had like two or three monster runs in that game and are like losing him. And I think was only like a fourth and a conditional pick in, in mm-hmm. 2012 that that'll always Make that'll always hurt me because he he had two thousand yard he had a thousand two one thousand yard seasons here. I'm like he he was such a beast, and I think the other one that I have is uh I got well I guess I have two I got trading up for J P Lossman because I I and I think that's a it shows that you should never trade up for a quarterback in the back end of the first round just to get a quarterback in the first round. Um, and I think everyone knows the story on J P Lossman, and I'm gonna go. Sean Merriman. I th- I remember being so hyped that we were going to have Sean Merriman. He was a monster on those Chargers teams. And he came here, I think he got hurt one year, and then the second year, he, I think he was good enough to at least play most downs, but he just he didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Marshawn Lynch is like, I f- even though he had two thousand, two thousand, two one thousand yard seasons, even though he was a first round pick, I still feel like Marshawn Lynch didn't really become Marshawn Lynch until he went to Seattle. So that kind of eases some of the sting a little bit. But I mean, who's going to forget that uh, Dave and Buster's Applebee's uh, spoof video he made for Monday Football? <laughs> Just an awesome human. Um, the the Jason Peters trade stings. Yeah. Uh, even though we did get Eric Wood out of it, we did get Eric Wood out of it. It's still you still traded one of the best offensive linemen in the entire entirety of 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 football history uh, in Jason Peters. So that stings a little bit. Um, like I said, Eric Wood lessens that blow a little bit. But going back to the JP Lossman draft, not trading up for Ben Roethlisberger. Bills were picking what thirteenth that year, thirteenth, and they ended up taking Lee Evans, who was the pick before. Ben Roethlisberger and the talk of town in Buffalo was, are we going to take Ben Roethlisberger? Are we going to take Ben Roethlisberger? Ben Roethlisberger, Ben Roethlisberger, Ben. Everyone was talking about big Ben going out and getting big Ben and the Pittsburgh Steelers pulled the trigger one pick before the Buffalo Bills. So not trading up and grabbing Ben Roethlisberger could be something because we end up with Lee Evans and JP Lossman. And I love Lee Evans as much as the next guy, but dang, he was wasted here because he never had a quarterback. Definitely. So, before we kind of wrap things up, Ryan, real quick, go over the draft results here. And again, we're going to put this on a Twitter poll so the fans, you guys can decide who you think won this uh, this draft. But Ryan, real quick, what were the picks? All right. So Mitch had Mario Williams signing to Mario Williams, trading for LaShawn McCoy, and the signing of Doug Flutie. Judge had trading for Diggs, signing for Cole Beasley, signing Cole Beasley. And signing Fred Jackson. Um, and then I had the Jerry Hughes trade, trading up for Josh and Terrell Owens. And I'll make this a nice little graphic and uh, I'll get it up today or tomorrow. And uh, oh, before we go, go, I have one little tidbit of information that I wanted to share before we left here. Matt Castle trade. So not trading for Matt Castle, but when we traded Matt, well, or I'm sorry, yeah, when we traded for Matt Castle, this is just according to Wikipedia. So I have no idea what trades occurred afterwards, but the pick the Buffalo Bills traded for Matt Castle somehow got in the hands of the Atlanta Falcons who took Grady Jarrett in the seventh round. So, How about that? Who did, yeah. did, we, did we trade for him from Kansas City? Was he in Kansas? Is that who we got him from? I think Minnesota. I think he was in Minnesota. Oh, that's Minnesota, right. He yeah. was in Minnesota. That's yeah. right. And then he ended up, and then we ended up trading him to Dallas. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You're right. 
But I, anyway, the pick that we traded for him somehow got in the hands of the Atlanta Falcons to Grady <laughs> Jarrett. So that stings. How, sure. how about? How about taking TJ Graham over Russell Wilson? Do we want to get into that? Well, that, will, that, that that's a whole that could be a whole episode next week, man. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I think Ty Dune did that for for Go Long. Yeah, yeah. That pretty in depth I, for but. sure. I think he I think he interviewed Buddy Nix for that. Yeah, uh, I think it was Whaley. Oh, Whaley. Right, right. It was something like that. If but somebody man. could find Buddy Nix, like, and just you know, bring a microphone onto a fishing boat and just have a two hour conversation with him, that would be something special. I, I would be super interested because I'll, I'll tell you, Doug Whaley's been uh, and, and have been out here kind of, I think, reshaping some of the some of the narratives during that job. I'd be <laughs> interesting to see what what I stand Doug Whaley. So this. don't even don't even I stand Doug Whaley. The man could find talent. He just couldn't build a locker room. And he true. also never got to pick his coach. That's true. He wanted Jim Trussell, which I thought was crazy. I don't know if that would have worked out. Well, that would have been crazy. Who would have thought? He liked the sweater vest. He really liked the sweater vest, guys. Right, exactly. So, real quick before we sign off, Judge, anything you want to plug while you're here? You know, take a minute if you have anything you want to promote. Uh, I mean, if, if the people watching and listening would be so kind as to tune in every Monday and Thursday night uh, to the Buffalo Fanatics YouTube, where this show will be playing now on the weekends. Uh, so, kudos to you guys for all your hard work. Now, I'm um, getting to go on the YouTube uh, as well. Um, but, um, yeah, Monday and Thursday nights, me, Dave, uh, our producer, Kendall, we go live. We, you know, we have a topic or two we like to talk about, and then we open it up to the comment section. And that's one of the really cool things. Like I, I like podcasting. Don't get me wrong. Like I love like shooting the shit with people and, and not having to like simultaneously stare at a comment section, but, um, there is something to the, the interaction with the fans as well. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that I really do enjoy about our show is it's literally it's 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 it, there's 200 of us having a conversation uh, all at the same time and and it's it's just really awesome so mondays thursday nights on the buffalo fanatics uh youtube channel you can catch the air raid hour uh at 8 p.m and and i gotta tell you guys the air raid hour is really really good if you, they really do he's not lying they interact with the folks in the comments and you know just have a really fun time there and it, it's a really good show uh, all the stuff that's the Buffalo Fanatics is live every day of the week. You'll find something you like any with Rico and Seabot with the smoke mm-hmm. break. And I, there's there's so much good stuff on. on I think on week, daily. My my proudest moment in the air raid hour is is two of the best best finds ever in the comment section. Number number one being you, Ryan, because <laughs> I think you got your start because like like you had your blog and you were absolutely killing it and blowing up Twitter like you always do. Um, but you were just like smoke in our comment section and just being completely awesome in there so i think i hit you up in the dms one day like come join the crew no, no you, did, uh, <laughs> you you did you did be an air raid guy that's what it, i emailed you i think you, yeah you i did. think you oh yeah we you came on right yeah yeah, yeah that's right because you did you did like i think it was when you were the bills guy still you did it yeah. was like be it was like be a bills guy and i was like yeah i'll uh i'll email i emailed them and you guys i it was at the trade deadline because i remember we talked yeah. about Desby king Oh yeah, we brought you on, and then uh, you know Kendall as well in, in our comment section. Now he's our producer. So the uh, the uh, the uh, the the comment section of the of the air raid hour really breeds some 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 talent here. So um, that's one of my other favorite parts of the show is just discovering new voices and, and hearing new people and, and getting to interact with new people. Uh, and I meant what I said the other day. You're the best follow on Twitter, so follow Matt Sports Rock too. <laughs> you. Like what I love is like you just love to trigger people, and then when they come back at you, you're just like I don't give a shit. Like cool, whatever. Like nothing bothers you. Like you, you are just troll level one thousand. It's amazing. I love it. My food takes are legit. That's not trolling. I really <laughs> maybe <laughs> we'll see. Oh man. So uh, that about does it though for this episode of the five a five report. This was a ton of fun, and and, and Judge, you're always welcome back on the show uh, for sure. And, yeah, we'll have that Twitter poll up for you guys to vote and choose who you think won this draft. And also, heads up, moving forward, our time's changing a little bit. We're still going on on Saturdays, but now Saturday's at noon. So uh, for our listeners, please just keep an eye out for that moving forward. It's going to be a little bit different uh, as we get going. But uh, for Ryan and for Judge, I'm Mitch. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, yeah.